Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey Pierce. And I'm the marketing director here at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled The Right Way to Handle Customer Objections and Negotiations. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session and we will be sending out a link to the recording 24 hours after this webinar. Throughout the presentation, please go ahead and submit your questions via the questions tab and we'll try and answer them as we go. And we will also get to as many questions as we can at the end of Kristen's presentation. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you um, our presenter today, Kristen Hare. Kristen is the founder and CEO of the Success League, which is a customer success consulting firm that works with executives to build and develop top performing CS teams. Kristen believes that CS is the key to driving revenue, client retention, and exceptional customer experiences. Her areas of expertise include developing customer su success goals and metrics, designing the optimal customer journey, and selecting technology, training teams, and building playbooks. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Kristen. Thanks, Corey. Hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. And I this seems like a hot topic. There's been a lot of people that have joined and have signed up today. So um, hopefully I live up to your expectations. We're going to be talking about objections and negotiation. And this is an important part of customer success. Uh, a little bit about me before we get started. Um, as Corey said, my name is Kristen Hayer, and I'm the founder of the Success League. We're a customer success focused consulting and training firm. Um, but before I got into the field of customer success, I was in sales. And I know, gasp, not sales. Um, but I started out as a salesperson a few years after college. I had a boss who kind of talked me into it. Uh, I'm outgoing, and he thought I'd be a good fit for the role. Um, but I wasn't very easy to convince. I always thought of sales as kind of dirty. It's something that you'd never want to do for a living. And I also thought that you had to have some kind of magical powers to be good at talking people into things. And what I learned from my first sales job, um, and this is mostly due to my really great boss who talked me into this, is that sales isn't rocket science. It's a set of skills that you can learn and not an ability that you're just born with. And I think we have a tendency to think of it that way. I would encourage all of you who are listening today to understand that customer success involves sales. Whether you're selling upgrades or expansion deals for money, or you're just persuading customers to adopt new features, or you're talking a VP into coming to a business review, there is a great deal of selling that is a part of our role. And I would argue that the best CSMs are great because they already have many core selling skills, the ability to ask great questions, an understanding of how to manage toward a goal, a consultative level of knowledge about the customer's business. Beyond these core skills, selling is really just paperwork. And so as we approach today's content on objections and negotiation, I hope that what you'll take away from this webinar is that you can do this. This this is important to our field, but you can. You can handle objections, you can negotiate, you can learn how to do both of these things because they're skills that you can develop, not gifts that you were born with. So what are we gonna be talking about today? So first of all, um, bear with me while I get my cursor to go to the right place, I'm doing this dual screen thing today. There we go. Um, we're going to be going over common objections. So these are things that we hear from a lot of our clients. Uh, we're going to talk about how to prevent objections. We're going to talk about why money isn't a real objection. Some of you might disagree with me on that, but I'm going to tell you why I feel the way I do. Then we're going to get into some negotiation tactics. We're going to talk about how you separate the people from the problem. We're going to talk about how you need to focus on interests instead of the positions that people are taking. And we're going to talk about how to invent options for a win-win at the um, end of this whole negotiation. And I'm also going to give you some tips on things you can try when you have somebody who's just not um, being a very good co-negotiator with you. You can't always control that. So that's what we're going to really cover today. To kick things off, I want to talk about the common objections that we hear a lot at the Success League. So the, there's different ones for different scenarios, but often we'll hear things around product and services. So your solution is missing a feature that we need. I think we've probably all heard that one. Or you aren't answering our support tickets quickly enough. Or 
The rest of our systems won't integrate with yours, so we need something different. You know, as you listen to those, what you understand is that objections are really the reasons that a customer gives you for not doing the things you recommend. I think when we think about negotiation, we always think of it in terms of sales or contracts, but it's really something that is broader than that. It's a way that a customer is trying to push back on having to change. And that's kind of the bottom line of what an objection is. Um, some that we see a lot in the time and priorities area. Like we don't have time to work on implementing your solution right now. That's one we hear a lot when stuff is getting stalled out um, during the onboarding phase of the client journey. Another one is another solution needs to be prioritized over your project. So that could be at any point in the customer's journey. When you're working on a project and it gets stalled out, often it's because something else has come into play. You might not even know about it, but it's taking away resources from your project. Other things you might hear are things around competition or other options, like your competitor offers more of the features we need. You might hear that if a customer is churning. Or we're doing just fine with our manual processes. We don't need to change anything about what we've been doing for the last 50 years as a company. Um, you know, accounting is fine by hand, pencil and paper. Um, or you might hear your competitor has a cheaper solution. I'm going to get to that one in a few slides. Um, so I'll leave that alone for now. And then you got, might get objections around resources and budget. So things like, I don't have enough team members to staff the project, or you only offer annual billing and we need it to happen quarterly, or I just don't have the budget for this this year. And again, I'm gonna come back to that budget one in a couple of slides. So these are things that we hear all the time. And you can see there's a really broad set of objections here. This is things that you hear right at the beginning of the relationship during onboarding. This is stuff that you might hear midstream as you're trying to get a customer to adopt best practices, or you're trying to get somebody to expand what they're doing with you. And you might hear objections at the end when a customer is trying to churn. So you have to be prepared to handle all of these. And I want to talk you through a uh, method that we like to recommend that helps you prepare for how to handle an objection. So first of all, one of the nice things about customer success is that you're dealing with the same issues over and over again. So that means you can plan for them. So how do you plan for objections? The first step really is to kind of brainstorm the list for your company and your team of the common objections that you deal with all the time. When we work with teams on this, we find there's typically 10 to 15 objections that come up all the time. Then you wanna prepare for three things. First thing is questions that you can ask. So you wanna make sure you ask questions to help you really understand the situation. Go deeper. If it's a customer who is churning, be sure you understand the real drivers behind churn. You can ask questions like, when did you first start considering other options? What was the major deciding factor and what were some of the other factors that you considered? What are your plans now? And when you're getting an objection that you, you know, I think one of the important things to remember is you really don't have anything to lose, especially if you're, you know, at the end and you're handling a churned customer. Um, feel free to ask questions that are maybe a little more deeper and direct than you ordinarily would, because there's no risk involved in asking questions at that point. So make sure you're prepared with questions that you wanna ask and really go into it trying to understand the situation from the customer's point of view. Number two is you wanna make sure that you understand things that you can share. So many times customers object to something because they don't have a full picture of the situation or the various options that are in front of them. For each objection that you've brainstormed, think about the things that customers sometimes don't understand and be prepared to talk about those things. So um, you, if you go back to my customer churn example, you, know, you would wanna be sure that the customer has thought through the change. You can make them aware of what it means to change solutions in terms of the cost of implementing something new. You could say that the new feature that they want is on the roadmap for later in the year. If that's true, don't make that up. <laughs> but, but if it is true, tell them that. 
um, you could remind them that shifting vendors comes along with a lot of change management and that your competitor isn't known for their helpful service. Um, you don't want to bash competitors, but it is okay to state facts. And so this is the place to be prepared with the facts that you want to make sure that you convey. So first you're asking questions and you're learning more. And then second, you're sharing what you have to share about the situation. And that can really help the customer see the big picture. And lastly, you wanna to come to the table with things that you can offer. So when you run into objections, often there is a middle ground um, to help get both your customer and your company back on track. A great example of this that surfaced, I think, for a lot of companies during 2020 was the idea of COVID contract extensions. So many companies offered their customers who are struggling um, either an extension of their contract for several months during the height of the pandemic or free services for a set period of time to help get them through the worst of it. Both of those are great examples of offers that helped customers stick around rather than churning. So knowing what you have to offer helps you go into those conversations really prepared to talk about what is a good solution for both organizations. So these are the things that you want to do to prepare for a conversation with a customer. So always make sure for your common objections, you're going in prepared. I want to give you an example of this. So let's say the objection is earlier in the customer life cycle. So we don't have time to work on implementing your solution right now. So one, you want to have some questions. So some questions you might ask are things like, what other projects do you have on your plate right now? Or how is this impacting your time? Or if we could provide more assistance, how would that help you out? So again, what you see there is you see a situation question, just learning what's going on. You see an impact question that's asking about the impact that all of those other projects are having on their time. And you see a value question at the end. If we could provide more assistance, how would that help? Um, number two, this is step two, um, you want to make sure that you are able to um, make statements that help to, to have the customer understand the big picture. So um, here we have an implementation, we, we might want to say, hey, we have an implementation team that could do the heavy lifting for you. Um, would that help? So you want to make sure that you make the customer aware that they um, have an option of having you help them. Or another thing that you could say is, hey, we can defer some of the training requirements if that helps out with your time. So maybe kind of lessen the expectations on the customers. They may not know that they can do that. They may be looking at this daunting list of training that you want them to take and thinking, gosh, I don't have time for that. So whatever it is, and of course, for every company in every situation, this list is gonna be different. Just make sure you convey the things that give them the big picture of their options. And then finally, number three, make sure you have some things to offer. So in this case, you could offer to provide um, temporary on-site staff <laughs> to assist. Um, you might offer to revise the project timeline with the customer to extend it, knowing that they have other things they're working on too. Or you might offer to meet with that buyer to advocate for additional resources for that person. So know what you have to offer. By coming to the table prepared with a list of questions to ask, things to share, and several offers in your back pocket, you will enter the conversation more confidently. And your confidence will help your customer understand that this is something you've effectively dealt with before, and that will give them confidence in your proposed solutions. It is also just a lot more fun to problem solve with a customer than to feel like you're being battered by all of their objections. Preparing responses to objections is a great team exercise. You'll find that every single person on your team has some way that they have been handling different kinds of objections, and by pooling your knowledge, you'll all get smarter together. So I'm gonna go to the fun slide next. This is why money isn't a real objection. I feel really strongly about this, and I know some of you, we have a pretty good size audience today. I think we have like 500 people. So I know in this audience, a bunch of you don't agree with me um, or you don't believe me here. And I think in a few specific industries that are more regulated, like government agencies and schools, for example, 
there may be actual budget cuts or constraints that they're dealing with. The rest of the time, I would argue that budget is rarely the actual reason for an objection. 99% of the time it is a mask for the real objection. So let me give you an example. So let's say I'm a VP of sales and you're my Salesforce CSM. You know that I'd benefit from the community functionality that Salesforce offers, uh, but it is not part of my current package. So it would be an upsell. I've mentioned in the past that I've been thinking about a community for our customers, but whenever you bring it up, I say, I haven't got the budget for it. I want to give you some insight into what's going on on my end of things. By the way, this is a real true story about me as a VP when I was uh, a couple companies ago and I had a Salesforce CSM and we were looking at communities. Um, here's, here's the customer side of the story. Um, I'm a busy VP. I know we need a community. I have not had time to do my homework on that. I don't know what is out there besides Salesforce. I can't just go to my executive team with one option. I need to look at at least a few of them. And I also need to understand more about communities in general. It's not my area of expertise. I don't wanna look dumb in front of the rest of the leadership team. I also don't want my Salesforce CSM bringing it up before I know more. I'll tell her something that she has no way of pushing back on and give her the, I don't have budget excuse. Um, and that'll keep her off my back while I do my homework and shuffle money around in my budget for this community initiative. That's literally what was going on in my world and in my head when I said, I don't have budget. But what did the CSM hear? She heard, I have no budget and this opportunity is dead. Um, that's what a lot of CSMs would have heard. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what she actually did in a minute. Um, this, this is a real example of mine. Um, I like this example because I think it highlights a couple of things. One, the budget wasn't the real objection. The real objection is that I hadn't had time to do my research and I felt like I needed to learn more about communities before having a discussion. I was using the budget objection to buy myself time. This happens all the time in customer success. And in specific cultures like the US, money is kind of a mildly taboo topic. So throwing that objection out there can seem like a bulletproof way to buy time or a softer way to say no. Very few CSMs have the courage to explore the situation further. Um, two, executives can always find money for things they value. I ultimately ended up buying Salesforce communities and that money came from giving up a few new headcount in my budget I moved the money around because I felt that the community would help minimize support tickets and we wouldn't need those additional team members anyway. So I saw enough value in Salesforce communities ultimately to make it happen. The third thing I wanna point out about this example is that I was a decision maker here. This example highlights why it is so important for CSMs to have relationships with decision makers. The Salesforce rep that I was talking about actually didn't give up. In reality, um, she had taken the time to build a really good relationship with me and she continued to gently give me information about communities and bring it up whenever she could without pushing me too hard. And after I did my research, we were able to have really candid discussions about their tool and I was able to quickly make a decision to open up my budget for the project. If she had been talking to one of my support managers, they would have been way more interested right up front, but they would have had to do a lot more work to get me involved and to get the project approved. So starting at the top, starting with the decision maker really pays off in situations where you're trying to avoid objections. Um, with that, I wanna talk about preventing objections, which is a way better way to deal with objections. So keep them from happening in the first place. A lot of the stuff that you're doing today is what prevents objections. So they happen when a customer is uncertain whether the effort it takes to change um, what they're doing today will be worth it. So if they're not certain about the results that they can expect, they're gonna give you objections. But by getting ahead of objections, you can avoid them almost entirely. And there's three things you can do that help with that. One is to really know your customer's business. Just being aware at a deep level of what they do and how they work can give you a big leg up in your discussions and help to prevent objections in the first place. 
the more closely you can be, or the more closely you can tie your solution and its advantages to your customer's business objectives, the less likely object, objections will come up. We teach a class on business strategy, and one of the tools that we use in that class is called the Business Model Canvas. This is a tool that has been around for a long time. Um, it's a great way to deeply understand a company, and I would recommend um, for CSMs who want to know their customers at a richer level that you go online, look up, it's literally called Business Model Canvas. You can find tons of versions of it online. Go look that up and then um, use that to learn more about your um, companies that you're working with. So make sure you know your customer's business. Second, you want to make sure that you're, as a company, setting solid expectations for clients. One of the biggest ways that we see customers get off track is when expectations don't match reality. And of course, this needs to flow across the entire organization because customers are dealing with different people at different points in time. Every step of the customer journey needs to set up the next step for success. So it's also important to remember that customers don't always hear things the first time. Um, and if you think about it, we always get kind of mad at salespeople because we're like, oh, they didn't set the right expectations. If you think about it, the first demo of your solution that they see, everything about your solution is brand new to them. They are not going to remember every little detail, even if a very diligent sales rep did their best to set expectations. Expectation setting needs to continue throughout the customer journey and the same expectations need to be reset possibly several times. So make sure that you're planning for that in your customer journey. Finally, you wanna focus on value. Customers who see value in your solution will have fewer objections. As you get to know what each customer values about your solution, and remember that each customer will value something that's a little bit different, you'll be able to more effectively help them understand the return on investment that they're getting from your company. This helps with everything you do. It helps with adoption. It helps with expansion opportunities. It prevents churn. It increases references and referrals. Demonstrating ongoing value is the most important part of your job as a CSM. And you need to be doing that proactively. That's the whole point of having a CSM. So make sure that you keep that focus on value and that alone will prevent objections across the life cycle of the, the customer. With that, I wanna transition from objections to negotiation. So sometimes we have to get into negotiations. Some things I wanna point out here. First, every negotiation involves another person. And when you're in customer success, you're negotiating with somebody that you have a relationship with or you want to have a relationship with. You need to negotiate with them instead of against them. And I think that that's a really important distinction uh, between the kind of negotiation that CSMs do and the kind of negotiation that sales teams do. Sales teams don't have to think about the long-term relationship. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't you always have to think about that long-term relationship. So it's absolutely critical that you consider the people aspects of the negotiation so that you can make sure that you can maintain that long-term relationship. It's also important to remember that each negotiator has an interest in both the outcome and the relationship. So facing the problem together instead of battling each other shifts the conversation from a conflict to a problem solving exercise. And that's really where you wanna land with negotiations. There's a lot of things on this slide, but there's, there's a few things I wanna call out. Um, one is don't let your fear run the show. Um, you know, if you're not really solid at negotiating, um, you might be kind of going into a negotiation conversation a little nervously, um, and you might be going in with some assumptions about what the other person is thinking that are based on your own fears. So um, try to go in with an open mind um, because that has you entering the negotiation from a positive place instead of from a negative place. Another thing you wanna make sure you do is allow people to let off steam. It's okay to pause the conversation or the negotiation when things get too heated or to take a break and just ask the other person how they're doing or feeling 
and let them talk. Um, I've had some situations where just the act of letting them talk about what's going on for them for five or 10 minutes took the conversation to a much better place. So give people that opportunity to um, let off a little bit of steam when you're in the middle of a heated conversation. And then the third thing I wanna point out on here is really practice your listening skills. Responding and paraphrasing and standing up for your own perspective all play a part in active listening. Um, if you have not been trained in listening, I think that that's an excellent kind of training to take as a CSM. Um, I wanna share one of our customers' situations because I think this is a great example of how they were effectively able to move to the same side of the table with a customer in a negotiation. Um, they, this particular client of ours works with schools and one of the school administrators they were working with was kind of a tough negotiator and also kind of a pretty dramatic person <laughs> in her communication style. And at one point in the negotiation, she shouted, why are you raising prices like this? You must hate children. And the CSM fortunately was pretty quick on their feet as well. And they paused for a moment and said, I can tell you're really passionate about helping the kids in your district. I actually really love kids and I wanna make sure your kids get the best possible outcomes here. What can we do to tackle the contract together that will get your kids the services they need here? So that CSM did a very artful job of moving the conversation to a positive place. I love that example because I think it shows clearly how you can take a very emotional, heated exchange and diffuse it by acknowledging emotion, reframing that accusation, and then position yourself with the customer on the same side of the table to solve the problem together. So I thought that CSM did an excellent job. Let's talk about interests versus positions. In negotiation, it is really important to keep in mind the difference between a position and an interest. So a position is what the customer says they want, and an interest is why the customer wants it. So why is this important? I think often people get locked into the position that they are taking when what is really important is the interest that they have in the outcome. Understanding the interest is what can help you as a negotiator get to a solution that works really well for both parties. So let me give you a simple example. Let's say that you have a customer who asks you to change a button from red to purple. I think most of us have had some similar situation before. Um, the customer's position is that they want a purple button. But here's the deal, without asking, you don't actually know their interest. So why do they want the purple button? There could be lots of different interests behind this position. One customer might want it to be purple because that's their brand color and they want everything to visually match their brand. A different customer might want the button to be purple because someone on their team is colorblind and they can't see the red button that's there right now. And of course, the solutions for each of these interests are totally different. You might say no to the first customer because purple doesn't go with your branding and because it isn't really a mission critical change, but you might also ask them if there are other colors that are consistent with their brand that would also work. So maybe it's black instead of red. Um, the second customer has brought up something that's probably impacting other customers and that might be more important to tackle. And you could solve for it in a variety of ways outside of making the button purple. So you could make the contrast higher, you could make the button black, there's a lot of different things you could do there. So by getting behind the position or the purple button allows you to come up with better solutions that fit both parties. So how do you do that? So there's some things here that I think can help. One is to ask yourself why a customer might be taking a particular position. So you know if they're just saying purple button, you can think, hmm, I wonder why they want the purple button. Um, and then you could ask yourself why they didn't choose the opposite position. So think, hmm, why is it not a yellow button instead? Why aren't they asking for that? Um, consider that sometimes customers have multiple interests. So it may be that they want it because it goes with their branding and also they have somebody who's colorblind on their team. So there might be multiple interests at play. You could also think about the idea of soft interests. So sometimes in a heavy duty negotiation, things come in that are really personal. 
like security or somebody's reputation or getting recognition in the company or maintaining control of their team. I think, you know, especially when pricing comes into play, recognition for being somebody who negotiated a good deal is often a part of a negotiation or somebody's position. So make sure that you consider some of those soft interests too. And then you wanna, as you're going into this, really make a list of the interests that are happening on both sides. So what are your interests? What are your positions? So think about that for yourself and think about that potentially for the other party. And then as you go into the conversation, you can kind of test those interests to make sure that you really understand what's going on. Another thing that you're doing as a negotiation is you're inventing options for mutual gain. Um, so the key point here is that you want to separate inventing solutions from deciding on a final solution. So this is not, hey, we're, we're trying to come up with what it is we're going to do at this stage of the game. You're just looking at what are some options that could potentially work for both parties. There's a great example I always think of here, where if you want your kids to eat vegetables for dinner, you don't give them the choice of vegetables or no vegetables. You give them the choice of green beans or carrots. So as you're going into this inventing options, you want to go in having a number of different scenarios that would work for you, but could also work for the customer. And that's an important part of negotiation. There's a lot on this slide. You're going to get the slides after the session, so don't feel like you have to take pictures or frantically write anything down. Um, a couple of things I want to call out here. Um, one thing you can consider as you're planning out different options is to consider the strength of the agreement. So this is adjusting things like the length of the contract or changing the timeline for an onboarding statement of work. Stronger or weaker than standard arrangements may be more appealing to the customer. Um, of course, don't weaken major clauses in your contract without talking to your finance or your legal team. Um, but ideally, those teams will have given you some flexibility and some guardrails that you can operate within. Another thing that I want to call out is the scope. So scope is a little different from strength. Scope might mean paring back an initial purchase or trimming the services that you're selling to the client or in some cases going a little bit bigger with what you're offering for the same price. Adjusting scope can be another way to creatively solve a problem in a negotiation. And then finally, look for shared and complementary interests. So one story here I think is relevant, and I'm sure that many of you have heard a version of this, is it's the story of the two guys fighting over a bag of oranges. So they ended up splitting the bag between them, but then found out later that one of them was using the orange peels to make cookies and the other was making orange juice. So if they had taken the time to understand their complementary interests, they could have both had twice the value of the oranges. And this goes back to my earlier comment on why understanding interests is so important. So there's a lot of other things on here. I wanna note um, a couple of things about what happens if you have a tough negotiator that you're working with? Um, and then we'll go to questions after I wrap this part up. So sometimes you run into a tough cookie. These are people who like negotiation for negotiation's sake, or they aren't going to give up until they got you, or they're overly emotional during the middle of a negotiation. So they're the people who make negotiation a real challenge and I'm looking at you purchasing departments, um, those teams tend to have people who like the negotiation for negotiation's sake. Um, so here are some tactics that you can use to try to improve these negotiations. So first, try to figure out what is behind their position ahead of the conversation. Do a little homework on the person in the company and instead of coming into the negotiation asking about their interests, Start from some ideas about their interests that you suspect are true, and then ask questions to confirm. So this is the difference between asking, why is the purple button important to you? And asking, hey, it looks like your brand colors are heavy on purple. Is that the main driver behind your need for a purple button? So showing that you've taken the time to think about their concerns and their needs is disarming. And that can open up a stronger dialogue for somebody who's, who's one of these tough negotiators. Second, don't defend your ideas. Instead, encourage the other party to pick them apart. 
So why? That seems so dangerous, right? Actually, what you're really doing here is asking the customer to tip their hand a little bit and give you a better feel for the things that are important to them. In taking apart your ideas, they will have to discuss their own, and this will give you better insight into the interests behind their positions. So again, this can open up a stronger dialogue. Third, you want to reframe personal attacks. The example I gave you earlier of the school administrators who said, you must hate children, is a great example, and it had a great reframing response. Anytime someone attacks you, you can take it down a notch by reframing. I could probably spend a whole hour talking to you about reframing. This is a common technique. So if you're not familiar with that, you can look it up online. And also the book Getting to Yes has some great examples of reframing. Finally, silence is golden. Silence makes people uncomfortable and we all have a natural tendency to wanna to fill the void. Ask a question and then just shut up. I personally have trouble shutting up. I mean, imagine I just spent 40 minutes straight talking to you all. <laughs> um, so what I do to keep myself from talking too soon is I count to seven in my head before I jump back into the conversation. Long pauses often help the other person open up. Um, so some people like to be very thoughtful in how they answer questions. And in those cases, you may need to give them even more time. So maybe up it from seven to 10. Um, know your audience and kind of gauge from there. And of course, these are just a few tactics you can try. There are two really good books on negotiation that you can use to go further. The first and my favorite is Getting to Yes. This book has been around for a long time, but it holds up. It came out of a bunch of research by the Harvard Negotiation Study, so it's based in a lot of research. The second book um, is called Never Split the Difference, and that book comes from a gentleman who is a hostage negotiator and has a lot of personal anecdotes and practical advice. Um, they're both good. They have different but largely complementary approaches to negotiation. So if you want to dig further into this topic, um, get one of the two of those books or both and, and take the time to read those. This is such an important topic in our field. With that, um, I will wrap up this part of my webinar and I want to open things up for questions. There's a lot of you, so hopefully we have a lot of questions. Um, Corey's going to shoot those to me. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yes. yes, so please go ahead and submit your questions. We have had a number that have already come in um, as you're going through, so we'll start with those and get okay. to how many we can. Um, so the first question is, um, what are some examples of questions that I can ask to get behind the budget objection? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, one thing that I like to do is go, oh, yeah, you know, a lot of people are having challenges with their budgets right now. That's true all the time. Um, but most of the time when, you know, when we hear that people are having a problem with their budget, there's also other little things that are bugging them. What else is bugging you? And if you position it that way, you're kind of doing a couple of things. You're softening it by saying, hey, lots of other companies are in your shoes right now. And lots of other companies have told us that it's not just the budget, it's other things. And that makes it safe for the other person to um, answer more truthfully about what's really going on. Um, I think another thing that you can do is, you know, especially if you know the customer pretty well, you can refer back to some of the things that you know may have been going wrong in the past and say, hey, you know, is this really about the 20 tickets that you put in last month? Or, you know, hey, I know you guys have been waiting on a couple of features from us for a pretty long time. Is that weighing in on this as well? And you can kind of fish for what else might be happening. And so those are two tactics that I would, I would recommend. I think, you know, you can always ask what we call impact and value questions. Those are always amazing kinds of questions to ask. So an impact question is what is the impact that this is having on your business? So if somebody gives you a budget objection, you might say, hey, you know, how is that impacting the other solutions that you're working with? Or, um, you know, what is the, going to be the impact of this budget cut since it's, you know, taking away our solution? And how are you guys going to be dealing with, um, you know, getting your work done? And so you can kind of explore that with a customer and that, We'll do a couple of things that will highlight for them that, hey, there's a cost to 
not doing stuff too. Um, but it'll it'll also give you more insight into what maybe is really going on. And then a value question is, hey, if we could fix something for you, what would that do for your business? Um, and so, you know, you can ask those kinds of questions too, like, hey, if there wasn't a budget issue, you know, um, what would you be looking at that would make this better? And then their answer will give you some insight into some of the other thinking that's probably going on behind the scenes. So these things sound kind of tricky, um, but they're not. They're really just you learning more about what's going on in your customer's head. Awesome, thank you. I love those yeah. question examples. Um, our next question is, how do you recommend keeping a decision maker engaged if they aren't the user of your platform? Yeah, so I think this has to start from expectation setting right at the beginning of the relationship. I'll talk about the fact that I realize most of you inherited a bunch of customers and you didn't have that opportunity, so I get it. Um, ideally, what happens is your sales rep who closes the deal introduces you, the CSM, to their buyer. You start having a conversation at or slightly before the point of sale, and you you keep that conversation strategic. It's about things like setting goals for the relationship in the long term, handling the change management that's gonna come along with the implementation of the solution. Your buyer has an interest in those strategic level things right at the beginning because they just bought something. They spent some of their precious, precious budget on your solution and they wanna make sure that whatever happens, happens well. So if you can grab them right at the beginning and hang on to them and keep the conversation strategic, um, it, it helps to keep that relationship over the long run. What you don't wanna do is you don't, especially if you have a lengthy onboarding process, you don't want to, as the CSM, step in at the end of the onboarding process. If your onboarding was one or two months, it's already too late to hang on to that relationship and you're going to have to rebuild it again from scratch, which is harder. So let me talk about that real quick because this comes up a lot. Um, if you are in the position of you don't have a, a decision maker relationship in an existing account because you weren't there at the beginning or you inherited it, um, it's super common. Um, what you can do to start to build that is one, identify who that person is. Um, and then two, try to get an introduction through your um, main point of contact. Uh, if that doesn't work, um, I think one thing that I have seen work really well, and I've actually experienced this personally, is you can start to gently reach out to that decision maker with things that are of strategic value. And what I mean by that is things that um, they would be interested in as an executive. Executives always have a pile of magazines. I have this pile of magazines on my desk. Uh, we all have it. We all think, oh gosh, yes. I am an executive and I'm going to spend a lot of time reading Harvard Business Review and it's gonna be amazing and I'm gonna read all of these books that I've been given and, and, and I don't, and none of us do. None of the executives do this because we are too busy <laughs> to do that. Actually, my podcast, Reading for Success, is a forcing function to get myself to read books that I know I should be reading. Um, so this is true of everybody. So if you can curate something that is, is specific to that customer's business and get it in their hands, it keeps them from having to dig through their pile of magazines to find stuff. You can make um, a library of things that are interesting to your clients. They could either be things that are about your industry or about business in general, or they could be benchmarking studies that you've done across your customer base or a really interesting customer story where somebody's doing something unique and innovative. All of those strategic items are interesting to executives. And if you can start feeding them that information over time, it can start to build that trusted advisor relationship um, without having too many conversations. And so at the next point where you're like, hey, let's have an executive business review, because they've been hearing from you, they'll be a lot more open to coming to that meeting and then you can build from there. So that would be my advice ideally awesome, start yeah. from day one <laughs> yeah. well right but i also yeah. like that recommendation of serving up uh you know valuable content i think that's a good key yeah. in most times yeah. um so our next question and we have we've have a couple that have come in that have been in the same kind of um theme um okay the question is, the example you gave about budget was about expansion what uh -huh. if 
the customer is saying they really just can't afford to continue with your service, like they're struggling to pay bills, et cetera, especially during like these difficult COVID times. How do you go about handling that when it's more of a budget with just renewal or even just continuing on? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, do make sure that it's actually a budget objection. Um, and you can do that by just probing a little bit and make sure there's nothing else going on. And if it is truly a budget objection, and I mean, the reality is right now there are companies that are really struggling still. Um, that's why they're doing the payroll protection program and extending that some more. Um, so, you know, in some cases that's true. And what a lot of companies have done um, during this time, because there's a, a lot of organizations that are, you know, having challenges financially. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but they're doing extensions of contracts or they're doing free contracts for a period of time with a commitment to come back at the end. So I think this is a bigger conversation for your organization, especially if it's around COVID, where you, you need to have some offers for clients. It's better to keep a client um, and help them through this period of time than it is to lose them and then try to get them back later. Um, it's hard to get a customer to come back. And the companies that are going to be doing well coming out of COVID are the ones who have proactively thought about what their customers needed and help them out, um, those customers are going to be loyal. Um, and that's what we're all looking for is loyal customers. So, you know, I think that's a conversation if it's coming up for you a lot right now that you need to bring to your leadership team and have a plan for that so that it's not just, you know, your whole team doing one-offs and dealing with it. Sure. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, some industries are more prone to budget issues than others. I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, government agencies do get their budgets slashed and, um, you know, schools fall in that category as well. So anything that's kind of in the public space, there's a lot more regulation around what they can and can't do. And in those cases, budget may be a bigger issue if that's a big part of the um, vertical that you go after as a company. So in that case, um, you need to have some plans for just, you know, even outside of COVID, how are you going to deal with a company that needs to leave because of budget issues? And there may be a couple of different options that you can throw out there that help them get value from your solution without leaving entirely. Awesome. Um, our next question is, have you experienced any nuances in negotiating live phone or in person versus via email? Yeah, so I personally don't think you should try to negotiate over email. I think that okay. if you've hit a real negotiation, it needs to be happening live. Um, there's the back and forth and dialogue that is so critical to a lot of the tactics that I talked about today. Um, and being able to read body language and being able to understand um, a person's real level of you know, frustration or emotion around a negotiation is a big piece of this. Um, those things get lost in chat and email. So mm -hmm. while you may kick off um, a negotiation, or let's let's say this is like a you know pricing negotiation, you may kick that off by introducing the pricing that you want to um, set for your customer over email. If it starts to turn into a back and forth, you have to pull that off of email and have a face to face with your person. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, our next question is, how do you suggest dealing with a churn call if you don't have the information on why they want to cancel? Kind of hard to prepare. Yeah, so I think what you want to do in that case is you want to prepare for all of your common reasons for churn. So just ahead of time, and you, this is another great team exercise, go through and list out all of the reasons you hear your customers saying they want to churn and then kind of do that um, exercise that I talked about earlier here. I'll flip backward in the slides a little bit and show you what I'm talking about. You wanna go here where you write down all the common objections you get during a churn call, write down the questions that you should ask to understand things a little bit better, write down the things that you wanna make sure you share for each of the objections that you tend to get, and then you want to know if there's things that you can offer. Ideally, you want to come in to any of those conversations with a couple of things that you could offer. Um, 
to help keep the client. Um, some cases you might not have that, it depends on your company, but that's sort of the ideal. So do this exercise with your team and um, what you'll find is that it helps you feel a lot more confident when you get blindsided by that customer that's like, I'm leaving. You can then go to your kind of playbook on objections and be really prepared for that conversation. Got it. Um, our next question is, um, in your opinion, who should negotiate an upsell? The sales team or an onboarding team or customer success manager? <laughs> I think um, I think CSMs are perfectly capable of negotiating, um, just like I think they're perfectly capable of selling. Um, this comes from me being um, a sales rep in the past. Um, it is not rocket science. Negotiation is not rocket science. Anyone can learn to do this. I think the best person to go into a negotiation is the person who has the relationship with the client. So at different stages of the customer's life cycle, that might be different people. So early in the customer's life cycle, the sales rep might have the stronger relationship with the buyer. And so they may be the right person to have that conversation. Um, later in the customer's life cycle, um, let's say during onboarding, the onboarding specialist might be the right person to have the conversation. Um, and then later it might be the CSM. So it kind of, I mean, I hate to waffle on my answer, but I'm gonna kind of say it depends. Sure. And it's the framework is think about who has the relationship because that person's going to be able to do what I talked about on, hang on, let me go to another slide. On this slide, because they know the most about that customer. So they're gonna know all of the different options and they're the one that's gonna be able to be most creative in the negotiation to come up with something that works for both parties. Awesome. Let's see, our next question says, what are some tactics to use if you've seemingly got a mutual agreement, but the actual signing of the contract keeps getting delayed? You keep hearing that the signature is coming, but still nothing. Okay, so um, this one sounds like it's very specifically about contracts. So one important thing to always, always have that is a part of your contract is a deadline. So um, this prevents this problem from happening in the first place. You can say, okay, we're giving you a contract. Um, this deal is good through X date. And, um, and you may have to negotiate that date as a part of the negotiation, but that it's so important to have a, a deadline date on your proposals and on your um, contracts because otherwise it could go on forever. And um, so that's that's one thing. That's one very tactical, practical thing that you can all do mm -hmm. is get a date on there. The second thing, though, is if if you can't have a date or for whatever reason um, the customer is blowing by the date that you've given them, you really need to go back into the conversation and understand what the hitch is. Because what what delays typically are is there somebody um, having an objection that is going on behind the scenes that you don't have visibility into. You need to get visibility into the objection. Um, sometimes what they're actually doing is they're pricing you out against a competitor. And if you don't have any visibility into what's really going on, you'll never know that and you can lose deals that way. So um, go back to the, I hate to say go back to the drawing board, but you kind of need to go back to the conversation where you're asking questions and you're really understanding what the customer values and that stuff that helps to prevent objections can um, really help you get a better understanding of why things are stuck. Got it. So kind of similar in terms of things getting stuck, but not with a contract. <laughs> um, this question says, do you have any tips when it comes to following up with clients? I tend to find some of my customers will show interest for an additional service or product and ask for further information to review with a team member or management. And then it's difficult to create further dialogue from there because they, they don't ever follow up. Yeah, so two, two things can help there. Um, one is when you're having the conversation and they're like, hey, can you send me some info? Always ask, absolutely, when would be the best time for me to follow back up with you? And put it on your calendar and do it. Or set a meeting, um, even better. So if you can, while you have them on the phone, say, yeah, I'm gonna send you information. Can we set up 
a follow-up call while I have you here. That will help you kind of give you both, set the expectation for both of you that you will be following up, one, and two, give you a deadline. So, um, you know, that's one thing you can do um, to make sure they get back to you. The other thing you can do is what's, um, I think in Never Split the Difference, he calls it, I think he calls it a takeaway. Um, but something something along those lines. Essentially, what you do is you send them a note. If it's been a while and you keep reaching out and they keep not getting back to you, say, hey, it sounds like this isn't really interesting to you. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna bug you about it anymore, um, but if you could confirm that this is, this is not something you wanna work on going forward, I would really appreciate it. It's basically you're taking away that thing that you gave them and it is, so incredibly effective at getting customers to get back to you because no one wants to have anything taken away um, yeah. and no one wants to be off your radar. Um, and, and you might be making some assumptions too about why it is that you're um, not on their radar. They might've just gone on vacation and not had time to get back to you. So by doing that kind of an email and you want to make it gentle, um, but you know, firm <laughs> where you're like, yeah, yeah I'm not going to bug you anymore. Then that kind of um, pulls it pulls it back to the customer's court and they will almost always respond to that one way or another, usually like, oh no, we're just still kicking it around on our team or you'll at least get some information out of it. Got it. Have you ever tried that one, Corey? Um, no. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's it works really, really well. Give it a shot. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can get the book, Never Split the Difference. And I think he's got like kind of a chapter on that or a section of the book on that. Awesome, yeah. Um, we have a question that came in that says, um, what do you think about offering discounts to customers for participating in a customer reference program or doing a case study and using that as leverage in a negotiation? I mean, I think you can use anything creative like that. Um, you do wanna be careful that it's not, um, if you're giving away money, you wanna be careful that it's not eroding the um, value that your customer sees in your solution. So. Um, those kinds of discounts should be pretty minimal. Um, I'm not a huge fan of discounting. I think that I'd rather add something that the customer gets than take away from my price because in a lot of people's minds, price equals value. So um, the higher your price, the more your customer values your service. You have to be a little careful about discounts, but you can be really clever about the kinds of things that are meaningful to you that also um, can you know give value to your customers as well. So yeah, if you if you think that you would get enough value out of trading some dollars for having somebody be willing to be a reference for you, go for it. Cool. Um, I will have this be our last question since okay. we're coming up at the end of the hour. Um, you mentioned a few books. Would you mind um, restating what those were? Oh, and yeah. also if you have any other resources that you recommend for handling objections or negotiations that you would recommend. Yes, and I'm out. looking this way because my bookshelf is over here. <laughs> and I will grab the ones that I recommended so you can see what they look like. Here is um, Getting to Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So this is a this is a really good one. Um, oh, and right next to it is the other one that I talked about. Never split the difference. So yeah, awesome. these are the two on um, negotiation that I would recommend. Um, this one is um, more of a business style book. Very interesting to read. This is more of a research based book. Um, very solid framework. Depending on your reading style, you'll probably like one more than the other. This is my preference, but um, they're both really good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again, Kristen, for presenting oh, thank all you this so much. information with us today. And thank you for the audience members for joining us. Um, just as a reminder, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and a PDF of these slides. Um, I know we had a lot of questions coming in asking because they want to share them with their teammates. So that's always great to hear. Um, also, at the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up. Please take a moment to provide your feedback. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's content and what other content you would like to see in the future. And and thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Have a good day.